Welcome everyone to this exciting session we have planned for today on the land and water and energy nexus of biofuels. My name is Lauren Barreto. I am the Chief of Staff at SDSN and I'll be your moderator today for this uh, very exciting session. So it's my privilege to welcome everyone on behalf of both the Fondazione Eni Enrico Mate theme and the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, SDSN who together in early 2019 launched an initiative aimed to connect key figures for the global energy transition, particularly engineers, scientists, and policymakers. Uh, an important group to, to have a conversation together, but a group that doesn't necessarily always uh, touch base and collaborate. The first report, Roadmap to 2050, a manual for nations to decarbonize by mid-century, was the result of a joint effort by these two institutions who, along with more than 70 experts operating in various contexts, including international agencies, academic institutions, research centers, think tanks, NGOs, public institutions, and the private sector, provided critical input for the development of a technical manual addressed to policymakers to support the adoption of decarbonization pathways in four out of the five most energy intensive sectors worldwide. Those sectors were power, hard to abate industries, including cement, iron and steel uh, production companies, transport and buildings. In the first roadmap to 2050 report, Biofuels, advanced biofuels, and synthetic biofuels were identified as potential key solutions for decarb excuse me, decarbonizing certain transport and industrial processes, notably aviation and cement. However, further investigation was needed to better understand the impacts and interactions between biofuel production and land and water use, as well as the breadth of biofuel application worldwide. The focus of the second report, Roadmap to 2050, the Land Water Energy Nexus of Biofuels, which was just released today, works to identify the impacts of biofuel and bio-derived synthetic fuel production in different regional contexts and study their technical application and market implications. We're very excited to have three authors from the report here today to share their findings and results. And we hope you will download the report to learn more after the event. Uh, and I'm sure that someone will plop the link in the chat for you if they haven't already. To kick us off today, I'd like to uh, first welcome our keynote speaker from FEME Leadership. It's our great honor and privilege to have Marzio Galeotti with us. He's the Director of Scientific Research at FEME, uh, and he's also uh, based in Milan, where previously he was coordinator of the Climate Change Modeling and Policy Research Program. He's also a professor of environmental and energy economics uh, at the Università degli Studi di Milano, um, and a fellow of the Center for Research on Geography, Resources, Environment, Energy, and Networks at the University of Bocconi of Milan. Dr. Galeotti, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. It's three o'clock in the afternoon here in Milan. And um, as I said, I'm the research director of uh, Fondazione Mattei uh, FIM. Uh, which is an organization which is, uh, uh, you know, jointly collaborating with the SDSN for this uh, roadmap project. Actually, it is the second uh, uh, such event taking place at an exciting time because uh, the COP in Glasgow is going on. This year, everybody has been talking about uh, decarbonization, net zero emission targets, uh, when and how. So. It is really peculiar. Moreover, today, if I am correct, uh, it is the COP Nature Day. So it is the perfect time to talk about biofuels. And uh, this research is the collaboration, as we said, between a research organization able with the capacity of uh, 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 putting in place high level research and researchers uh, doing uh, original uh, work together with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, uh, who has a special proximity to policymaker with the ability to provide policy support with a sound research basis. So here we're talking today and we are illustrating shortly a report that has been done uh, on biofuels and biofuels are very important because 
as I said, everybody is talking about decarbonization. We cannot afford to leave out any po po possible technology uh, source uh, uh, to reach the goal of decarbonization. And biofuels can play a very important role. Uh, we are told that they could uh, increase their share from 1% up to 20%, at least in the net zero emissions uh, uh, scenario uh, put forth by the International Energy Agency with this uh, uh, well-known uh, uh, reports that has been released a, a few weeks ago. Uh, at the same time, I was uh, reading in the uh, Urena Renewable Energy Job, the annual review 2021, that biofuels are able to create or they created up to 2.4 million jobs uh, uh, last in 2020. So they really are very important. They can play a, an important role, but they also are characterized by delicate issues concerning the social and economic impacts, the impact on water resources, uh, the impact on land. We are going to hear uh, many things about these aspects in a few minutes. So the report really uh, adopts a holistic approach to the potential of biofuels as a, as a technology for the energy transition. And just to uh, complete my uh, short uh, uh, speak, I want to spend two uh, words on a FIMS uh, activity because uh, energy transition, decarbonization and the energy transition are the overarching theme of a FIMS uh, uh, new uh, uh, research activities and research programs that we have put in place uh, uh, starting this year. We are investigating or we have a program on nature-based solutions. We have a program on, program on uh, the new energy technologies for the transition. We are looking, for instance, at hydrogen. Uh, which is a very important thing everybody's talking about uh, these days. Uh, we are also uh, interested in pursuing or carry on our modeling tradition uh, by uh, looking at agent-based models in particular. And we are also looking at climate finance uh, um, and uh, uh, other aspects. So that's what uh, uh, FIMI is, is doing. And therefore I will uh, 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 leave the floor to uh, the speakers uh, who are going to illustrate the details of this report. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Galiotti. So the next session of our agenda is an overview of the report contents and main goals of the roadmap project. It is our honor to have uh, three of the co-chairs with us for the program, and they're each going to provide brief presentations on the chapters that they contributed to. Um, we're also going to have time for Q&A after, so while you're listening to their presentations, I hope everybody will consider some questions. You can send them through the chat or the Q&A feature in Zoom, um, and you don't have to hold them to the end, so you know, feel free to send them now. We'll, we'll ask them all at the end, um, but feel free to, to put them on in the chat as they come to you. Our first presenter is going to be Joaquim Sayabra, a professor at the University of Campinas, uh, also called UNICAMP, within the School of Mechanical Engineering. He has experience in the field of bio-based economy, developing several projects for government and private institutions in the evaluation of techno-economic and environmental performance of bioenergy systems, as well as in the development of regulations on biofuels. So please, Dr. Sayabra, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thanks a lot for the introduction and the opportunity to work in this very challenging project and talk about biofuels. And thank you for the invitation for this, this, uh, uh, this event today, a very important date. Uh, I'll try to share my screen uh, just one second here. Okay, I believe you can see my screen now. Yes, um, it looks great. Okay, thank you. Um, so the idea um, today is just to give an overview about the report. Of course, I invite you, um, I invite everyone to take a look at the report. We have several references to support what is in the report. And uh, to start uh, from the conclusions, of course, we don't have a very 
conclusive answers about uh, biofuels. We have multiple options. And as, I, as Marcio said, um, biofuels is one of the tools, one of the tools that we have for decarbonizing um, emissions in uh, the transport sector. So um, I'm very enthusiastic about the opportunities that we have using biofuels, but of course there are concerns. So uh, in, I'm here just and the idea is just to give an overview about the uh, what we have in the report. So I'll just set the scene and again invite you to see the details uh, that are presented in the report. So initially, um, okay, I think now it's working. First, uh, we need to recognize the importance uh, of the transport sector for the global CO2 emissions. As we can see in this graph here on the left, uh, we have rising emissions and transport sector is responsible for about 25% of the energy CO2 related emissions. So it's quite a lot, it's a quite substantial contribution from transport. And more specifically, uh, the road transport is responsible for more than 70% of the transport emissions and uh, particularly uh, the road uh, transport for passengers. And we have these situations because transport is uh, heavily dependent on oil. So basically fossil fuels are used for transport. We have a uh, few options uh, different from oil today. So uh, it's important to know that we have a significant challenge for deep decarbonization and transport for all types of transport, but especially in the hard to abate sectors, shipping and air transport, uh, in addition to um, uh, road transport, as I mentioned. So biofuels today is one option that we have for decarbonizing emissions in the transport but the role uh, of the um, but transport uh, biofuels still play a very limited uh, role in globally speaking um, today we have two main biofuels we have ethanol and we have um, biodiesel Bioethanol is uh, heavily used in the US and in Brazil and a couple other countries, but in general, uh, we are talking about a very limited contributions uh, for transport. Uh, but it can play a very important role in the future. The potential of bioenergy and biofuels is quite huge, uh, and uh, harnessing this potential, uh, it, it depends on the conditions that we have to produce these uh, biofuels. And the conditions are there, but we need policies to define this uh, expansion of biofuels. Uh, future scenarios, um, uh, assuming a very uh, uh, aggressive options for decarbonizing our economy, of course, they need or uh, they uh, point the directions that we need to use biofuels. Biofuels, again, will be a very important tool for decarbonizing our transport sectors and bioenergy in general to uh, help the decarbonization process in other sectors, other energy sectors as well. Uh, and there are, of course, very important reasons why biofuels have the potential to provide multiple benefits for our economy. Again, of course, it can uh, bring multiple contribution, uh, contributions for GAG emissions reductions, especially uh, in those sectors that are hard to abate, as I mentioned, shipping and air transport. Uh, but also important contributions for road transportation as well. Another important aspect of uh, bioenergy and biofuels in particular is because we can uh, combine bioenergy with CO2 removal through uh, BECS, carbon capture and storage in the bioenergy industry. And this, is, and this can be very convenient for our uh, zero emissions future. Also, uh, biofuels have the potential to enhance air quality because of the lower emissions of local pollutants. 
and biofuels can improve the energy um, or the engine performance, for instance, and we can uh, blend ethanol to gasoline to improve the energy performance of our vehicles. Biofuels well, uh, can also help improving the energy security uh, in different parts of the globe. And finally, as uh, uh, has been already mentioned today, um, biofuels have the potential to spur uh, the economic development, uh, development in rural areas. So these are all, all very important and strategic reasons why we should export biofuels as an alternative uh, for the decarbonization process uh, globally speaking. But of course, uh, there are risks when uh, the implementation of biofuels are not well planned. And here I mentioned four uh, process for concerns that we had, and I believe, Christina, we will address all these points. We have the potential competition with food supply, uh, the deforestation process, damage to ecosystems, and the reduction of carbon stocks. But again, uh, these are uh, very important risks if the implementation of uh, biofuels are not well planned. So, uh, in order to have a good assessment uh, uh, about the sustainability of biofuels, uh, it's very important to have a good life cycle performance. So, the life cycle performance of biofuels will be key for the expansion of biofuels. And uh, again, it's important to recognize that bioenergy is part of the terrestrial carbon cycle. So uh, the life cycle contributions in terms of greenhouse gas emissions come from other uh, contributions, not because of the combustion of the biofuel. So as mentioned here, uh, the net contributions uh, from the life cycle emissions of biofuels come from the use of fossil fuels for the production of bioenergy or biofuels and because of the utilization of fertilizers and potentially because of land use change emissions. But when we combine all these contributions, what we have for most uh, of the biofuels is that in general, we can say that biofuels have the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions compared to the fossil fuels, considering all the contributions from the life cycle. Within the life cycle of biofuels, it is, it's especially important for us to consider the contributions associated to the biomass production. So, of course, it will be important to uh, take a very close look to the regions where biomass is produced, the carbon stocks in that areas, the utilization of fertilizers and the utilization of fossil fuels for the production of biomass. Combining all these elements, we have still the conclusions that, okay, biofuels can reduce greenhouse gas emissions when displacing fossil fuels. But we need to pay close attention to the efficiency and how biofuels and biomass is produced, is cultivated. More specifically, we have to pay attention to the land use change emissions. And in this case, we can have uh, contributions, uh, more emissions and or to increase the carbon stocks in the soil. Because of course we don't, something, one thing that we don't want is uh, to cause deforestation for the production of biofuels, of course. Uh, deforestation can lead to huge emissions of CO2, but when we cultivate biomass in degraded lands, we have the potential to actually increase carbon stocks in the soil. And in this case, I think it's important to separate two different concepts, the direct land use change and the indirect land use change. Um, Again, life cycle performance will be key for biofuels, and I believe, Christina, we will address this point uh, further in the next presentation. So uh, here I just want to highlight that this aspect must be uh, considered when assessing the sustainability of biofuels in general. And 
talking about the um, sustainability assessment uh, of biofuels, I think will, it will be very important to use the sustainability schemes, the sustainability initiatives as a tool to address this topic. We have multiple initiatives to evaluate the sustainability, certificate and verify the sustainability of biofuels worldwide. We have regional initiatives, we have national initiatives, we have international initiatives and multi-stakeholder initiatives. Um, many of them are still in place so they can have or they can be used uh, for the assessment of the sustainability of biofuels. Usually these sustainability schemes, uh, they address of course the potential of greenhouse gas mitigation from biofuels, but there are other concerns they address too. The, the social economic contributions uh, or the potential uh, contribution for, uh, for the food market and so forth. So uh, to close my presentation here, and again, you can see the details in the report. Um, Sustainability schemes will be, again, very important tool uh, for the sustainability assessment of the biofuels. But uh, the compliance with certification does not mean that we have a sustainable production. So uh, for the expansion of biofuels it will be essential to have uh, investment in research and development the implementation of good, uh, good governance, to create a proper environment for innovative business model so that we can expand the production of biofuels in a sustainable way. So with the, uh, this uh, very short presentation, this closing remarks, I, uh, in closing remark, I just want to thank you for your attention. And of course, uh, I'm totally available to uh, uh, the, Q, the Q and A session and discuss any of these elements further with you. So again, I invite you to take a look at the report. Thanks for the opportunity. And Lauren. Thank you so much. Dr. Thank you so much, Dr. Sayabra. Uh, I see we do have some questions coming in. Uh, again, I encourage all of our participants to feel free to throw them in the chat or uh, use the Q&A feature. Uh, we will be taking them all at the end. Our next speaker is going to be Maurizio Massi, who is a professor in applied physical chemistry at the department of in the department of Chimica. Um, in the I'm sorry, I should have taken yes, Italian yes, in preparation for day, yes, today. Yes. The Materiali Ingegneria no, uh, uh, Giulionata of the Chemistry Materials and Chemical Engineers. <laughs> Um, so he studies uh, reaction kinetics and chemical reaction engineering and production processes for advanced inorganic materials of microelectronics and uh, photovoltaic applications. So he's a great person to be speaking with us today. And I will just flag as well, Dr. Masi, um, we do have a question that I think you might be answering in your presentation, but if not, maybe it's worth taking just a minute right now to do it. Uh, someone is asking about the definition of biofuels that we're using for this report. Uh, okay, um, so okay. I don't want to preempt your presentation, but no, 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 uh, but like that easy, might be something that we want to we want to take early. The floor is yours. Okay, so let me first of all share the screen. Okay. Okay. I think that is in full screen. Okay, for us uh, uh, during the report, biofuel was uh, everything was uh, uh, produced starting from uh, uh, vegetable like uh, uh, raw material. So something that uh, can be cultivated or can be a waste from the uh, food industry. And uh, now we can extend, I think, uh, the definition also to all the fuel that will be recovered uh, from the general waste that we have uh, uh, in our uh, uh, urban life, because that uh, are very rich of carbons and those kinds of waste. So it's possible to, uh, to have process to extract fuel from waste. And that it will be a really new opportunity that uh, really decrease uh, 
the uh, life cycle assessment uh, of uh, this kind of uh, uh, fuel, in particular with respect to the use of water and the use of land. Uh, okay. Uh, so now, uh, okay, let me see. Okay. Uh, practically, to talk about uh, the process to produce biofuels, uh, we have a really uh, a, a, a rich garden. We can really uh, take uh, many uh, process uh, uh, that starting from different biomass can be converted in biofuel. But uh, as uh, Joachim was saying before, actually today bioenergy, so bio, the energy that we uh, obtain from biofuels accounts only for about one tenth of the total uh, energy supply. And uh, about that tent, more than 90% is coming from the first generation biofuel like the bioethanol. So bioethanol today is the leader for the um, production of biofuels. But uh, it has been uh, said very clearly by Joachim, and I think uh, we must uh, stress uh, uh, again, uh, this point, uh, different biomass availability is uh, a classical regional problem. So there are many uh, social factors about production of, um, uh, uh, of vegetables that can be used to uh, produce biofuels, and that are really regionally dependent. And so it's impossible to find a single optimal raw material. So the real uh, uh, point of view for addressing the role of biofuel in the energy scenario is to think locally instead to think uh, globally. So global optimization is depending by the local optimization. And uh, another point that uh, is really important that we must consider the energy is an additive state function, is also a commodity. So the lower the cost, the better. And uh, we have in front of us many options. So we have to consider that uh, we are planning our future in the next 30 years. And so we still uh, will face innovations. And uh, so we can also look into our world that we no, it is not possible to electrify all uh, the countries. It is also not possible to, uh, to construct pipelines for hydrogen in all the plants. So the use of liquid fuels is really a part of the game. And uh, as uh, all the, the people say from centuries, when we are facing a very big problem, we must uh, uh, move with all the caution that is possible. So using the, the old quote, don't put, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So let's have a, a very short review of the technology. So the classical is the biochemical platform. So the digestion of uh, vegetables, uh, raw materials, uh, for the production of bioethanol. That is a really a very well-established technology, but uh, the real problem that we have here, uh, that we are producing uh, a very diluted uh, ethanol, uh, and so we must uh, make the distillation of water outside. And so uh, we are losing part of the energy in obtaining uh, an high concentration ethanol, and usually uh, it is, uh, adopted as a blended uh, to, uh, to gasoline, so the E10, 10% uh, ethanol. Uh, we can use agricultural residues, municipal wastes, and so uh, we are sure that we can avoid the competition of food. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, changing the lignio cellulose biomasses, uh, we, have, we have to consider that most of them are refractory to fermentation, so we need pretreatment. Also, biomass uh, digestion to biogas uh, has been exploited in uh, many wastewater treatment plants. So the fermentation of many, uh, of many wastes from 
waste, uh, wastewater treatment. But the real problem is here we have a production of only 50, our gas is only for 50 percent uh, methane, while the other rest is uh, carbon dioxide. We can improve the concentration of methane through the methanation process. So using a catalytic process, but uh, we are constrained on purity. And uh, uh, also when we are thinking to use municipal waste to biogas, we are also to consider uh, we need to mobilize uh, a huge amount of mass. And so we need to really have a, a logistics that uh, must be favorable. The other uh, traditional platform is the one that involves uh, the fatty acid and uh, fatty acids, methylator are exploited for blending up to 20%, but uh, the production is strongly, uh, is really localized nearby the, 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 the production of the oil. And uh, we have a, a, a very heavy uh, byproduct that is glycerin that is produced in high amount. So uh, glycerin uh, may be valorized in chemistry, in pharma, but in food and paper sector. But uh, uh, the mass of glycerin that we are going to produce uh, in the energy sector is uh, uh, huge with respect to the mass that is needed by those markets. And also uh, fame uh, are um, characterized by the poor behavior and low temperature, so they cannot be used in the aviation sector. That will be probably the leading sector where uh, biofuel will be used. We cannot place batteries in, in an airplane, and also uh, hydrogen is not so uh, safely used at uh, the low temperature that we have in the high atmosphere where uh, the, our airplane will, uh, uh, will fly. And uh, also, if you consider uh, the hydrogenated vegetable oils, uh, we can obtain high performing fuel, but uh, that can be used also for aviation. Uh, and uh, the problem is that uh, they can be produced already in the existing uh, infrastructure because uh, they, we are using the same uh, process that are typical for the petroleum industry. And so we can really operate uh, using co-feeding. So we can have a, a transition uh, in time with really low investment cost and risk of uh, uh, or deployment. Uh, the byproduct that is obtained uh, is propane that, uh, per, that is uh, easier to valorize because propane uh, it is a nice hydrocarbon. Uh, then we have the thermochemical platform. Thermochemical platform is rather new. Uh, we have uh, uh, practically three processes, the pyrolysis, where we heat up uh, up to a decomposition temperature. And so we have uh, uh, the possibility to gasify and to obtain liquid, uh, a fraction liquid, uh, solid and gas uh, fraction uh, um, of the, uh, the decomposition products of the biomasses. And uh, all these uh, uh, fractions can be upgraded uh, through hydrotreating to jet fuel. So that is a nice, uh, a nice route. The other alternative route is gasification that uh, can be exploited user for methane production if we add hydrogen, or for the main route that I see today, the uh, obtaining of, of syngas uh, and uh, with proper purification. And when we have syngas, uh, that is uh, one of the uh, bricks of the petrochemical industry. You can do whatever you want. Uh, the Cinderella part uh, is given uh, by the hydrothermal liquefaction that uh, still quite neglected, uh, but uh, because uh, it's not so developed up to now, but it provides a very nice uh, single liquid output with low oxygen content. And uh, here we have already a, a plant uh, from ENI 
in uh, Sicily. And uh, I am yeah, pressing two tables simply to have a summary of all uh, uh, the process that can be uh, analyzed in the report. And really, uh, I suggest to go through and, and read the, the report. But uh, the, my final statement are biofo biofuel production uh, should not be assessed against fossil fuel alone or against electrification for the transport section. It's one egg that we must put in the basket. Uh, so they are not in competition, but they are part of the, uh, uh, a part of the, uh, of the game and uh, can be uh, really thinking about uh, in an intermediate platform. We are making a transition and the transition cannot be a shock transition. We must change uh, during the years. So also they can really uh, help the electrification because uh, practically they have the same role of a battery. So biofuel are natural accumulator of energy. Uh, now uh, we are facing uh, all the challenges when we need to change the scale of our product. So decentralized versus centralized approach that depend only on the logistics that you have in the country. And uh, if we po it is possible uh, to de develop uh, combined approaches because uh, uh, we can produce the biofuel together with high value chemicals that can be enhanced, especially in, uh, in particular country, the revenues for the people that are working in this kind of plan. Okay, well, thank you for the occasion that we have to talk about uh, uh, these topics and also to work on these topics. That is uh, really important uh, in the next future for the decarbonizing of our planet. Thank you a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Masi, and thank you again to our participants. We see your questions coming in and we'll be getting to them shortly. We have one more presentation from Dr. Maria Cristina Rulli. She's a full professor of hydrology and water and food security at the Politecnico di Milano, where her research focus is on the interaction between hydrological processes and humanity. Um, so she's been investigating the impacts of food and water security, um, the impacts to them from global climate change, um, and, you know, has a wealth of wealth of experience in this area. Um, I know, too, there's some questions coming in on the chat, specifically looking at some of the trade-offs here with food systems. So hopefully she'll answer some of those questions and we'll turn to the rest of them in the Q&A after. Dr. Rulli, over to you. The floor is yours. So thank you, Lauren, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be invited to present the chapter three of, uh, of the roadmap. This uh, chapter is devoted to the analysis of uh, the nexus uh, between uh, water, land, and first generation biofuel. Let me at first uh, to thank uh, to, to, the, to the colleagues who helped me in uh, writing this uh, chapter. And uh, they are Paolo Dodorico from the University of California at Berkeley, here in this room, Nicolas Galli from Politecnico di Milano, Monia Santini from the Euro Mediterranean Center of Climate Change, Gianfred Delangelo from the British University of Amsterdam and Joaquin Seabra from the University of Campinas. So uh, in chapter three, we look at the environmental impacts of first generation biofuel, pay attention in particular to the competing needs from land and water resources by food and biofuel sectors that are, we can say, at the forefront of the energy food debate. Due to this competition, a number of questions on the land, food, and energy nexus have been arising during the last years, including those related on the effects of food security environment and on the displacement of land use. So in the 
paragraphs of chapter three, we try to address those issues. We describe the main crops used for first generation biofuels production, where they are produced and where they are consumed, and also the extent of land used for the cultivation of biofuel with respect to the land available on, on our planet for plant cultivation. Because uh, some of uh, the main crops used for first generation biofuel are so called the so called flexible crops, uh, that means that they are uh, edible uh, crops uh, that can be used as primary food for humans or as feed for animals or as feed for producing bioenergy. We analyze the role played by first generation biofuel on energy and food security. We highlighted why the competition for natural resources use is emerging in the context of food and energy security, pointing out that it's due to the fact that the growing society demands for food food and energy really on, on the same pool of limited natural resources. We analyzed so the pros and cons of introducing biofuel, highlighting that they have the potential to decarbonize in society. Also, they may contribute to achieve energy security in countries like, lacking uh, direct access to fossil fuel deposits. And also, they can enhance higher profits from the use of crops than those obtained from the food market sale. But then we pointed out that, uh, however, the sustainability of biofuel has been questioned in the recent years in connection with uh, food versus fuel trade-offs and with uh, the water and the land consumption issues. In fact, biofuel affects food security through, we can say, two main ways. At first, they what um, food and uh, fuel compete for the same natural resources used to support food production. And then uh, the structure of bioenergy interventions can have an impact on agricultural product productivity. And also they can affect food security outcomes. It has happened, for example, in the case of the transition to monoculture for biofuel production, that often results in, in an intensive use of fertilizers and also in, in an overconsumption of water resources. In, uh, Addition, uh, we look also to the food and energy trade-offs by means of the four pillars of food security. So in this context, we analyze the effect of biofuel production on the first pillar, that is the availability of food. And we show that some studies in the literature uh, are reporting that land management practice, like, for example, the mechanization of agriculture that are aimed to increase biofuel production for maximizing profits, could boost also crop production, so allowing the crop, that crop demand to be met. But then, uh, we, we show how the use of natural resources for producing biofuel crops means also the subtraction of natural resources to food production, so in turn bringing to the competition from the natural resources. Then we study the, the effect of biofuel production on the access to food that depends on the equilibrium balancing food supply and demand over time. In fact, over time, food prices could drop due to investments in mechanization, thus balancing the market. But if supply does not keep pace with the demand, it can also happen that an increase in food crop demand for different uses than food can increase crop prices. 
we then analyze the, the, the pillar of food stability, that is the pillar looking to the availability over time of crop supply. We show that uh, from one hand, biofuel markets can improve the security of farm incomes and also the energy subsurfacency from one hand. But from the other hand, fluctuations in food supply can exacerbate food insecurity conditions. Biofuel energy market can, in fact, diverge food crops from the food sector to the energy sector, making the food system less resilient to shocks, for example, climate shocks, like floods, droughts, and so on. Then we analyze the effect of first generation biofuel production on land use change, considering the direct and indirect land use change. And we also examine the implication of direct and indirect land use change on greenhouse gases emission. We consider also the fact that the consequences of indirect land use change can be delayed in space and time, so generating a variety of spillover effects and socioeconomic externalities. In fact, the land claim to expand the rangeland and cropland in response to uh, food crop uh, diversion from food to biofuel production displaces the effect on people and ecosystems to other location from those that could benefit from biofuel production. Moreover, the marginal lands that can be used for low emission land conversion in the reality may be vital for the subsistence of some farmers. Then we move to analyze the current water use for biofuel production and the pressure on water resources. In this context, we describe in detail the physical processes through which water is used for biofuel production. Then we describe the metric presently used for accounting the water use for biofuel production. This metric is called water footprint. And the three components of the water footprint were described and the environmental implication of using the green, the blue, and the green water were deeply analyzed. And uh, in analyzing the water use in biofuel production, we paid special attention to the source of water use for growing biofuel crops. So if it is uh, rainfall or if it is irrigation water, and we also pay attention to the pollution of water associated to biofuel crops. And um, the use, uh, um, the, the, the analysis on the type of water use is uh, really, really very important. Uh, for, from a sustainable development point of view, view because it allow, no, it allow us to know, uh, to make some, uh, some analysis on the, if the renewal, the renewal of water is possible. Then to answer to the question regarding the possibility of increasing agriculture production, we look we analyze the two main strategies uh, that, that, that are the agricultural intensification and the agriculture extensification, highlighting the need to move towards the sustainable intensification that can have positive effects not only on the biofuel production chain, but also on the food system as whole. Then uh, we pay particular attention to analyze the extensification of agriculture. And the reason why is because some scientists advocate the use of marginal land for biofuel feedstock production 
And uh, even if uh, we acknowledge that from a purely economic point of view, there are yet some uncertainties on the availability of, and on the productivity of the marginal land for biofuel, we saw that the main issues arising if we consider the social impacts of the use of the marginal lands, because the use of marginal lands can have uh, really uh, dramatic effects on indigenous communities. In fact, what we call unused lands or marginal lands is often is vital for indigenous communities that benefits for from the ecosystem services provided by those, those uh, lands. So it emerged that attention is due to the scale of the benefits of using marginal land. Then uh, we look to the impact of climate change on bioenergy crop cultivation. We analyze the sources of uncertainty or of the uh, climate scenarios, so looking to the, climate, the type of climate change scenarios, to the socioeconomic development pattern, to the different crop and regions, and to the uncertainty in the modeling and port and constraints. Then we analyze the expected impacts in terms of, uh, of uh, the extent of the land suitable for uh, crop cultivation. Then uh, we, uh, we conclude our, our report, uh, uh, our chapter, looking to the social impacts and to the controversies of uh, biofuel expansion. So we analyze the impact of biofuel production on uh, on the global agrarian development. We analyzed in particular the phenomenon of the large scale and acquisition. And in the context of the large scale and acquisition, it has been observed that in many instances, the lands that, that has been appropriated through, uh, through these investments is transformed from small scale semi subsistence traditional farming to large scale industrialized commercial agriculture. So we look to the implication of biofuel production on the commodification of agriculture and on the transformation of the agriculture itself. So I want to conclude to, to thank. Uh, for for this opportunity, I am available to answer to to all the questions. And uh, please uh, uh, write me in the chat or write me by email. This is my address. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ruli. So we're going to turn now to the discussion portion of our program. Um, I'm going to ask all of our authors and speakers to come back on with their cameras. We'll have some you know, discussion questions between us, and we'll take some comments from the floor. And I'll apologize. I know that uh, Dr. Ruli will be with us, with us for a few minutes, but uh, she's going to have to sign on off a little bit early because uh, she has some classes to teach today. Yeah. So we're also going to welcome uh, Paolo de Orico to join uh, for some of this conversation as yeah, well. Yeah, I'm giving the floor to Paolo. Paolo is uh, my co author in the chapter three, so he will be very happy to answer to the question. And I will be happy to if someone wants to write me an email. Thank Wonderful, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to start with a question that I'm going to pose to everyone, um, and maybe we can take it in the order in which you spoke uh, to go around the, the room, if you will, the virtual room, about what you see as the key challenges for scaling biofuels from each of your perspectives. Um, and I'm going to try to get through a number of questions, so I'm ask, going to ask you to keep it brief and maybe just pick one or two uh, key challenges. I know there are a bunch that we could talk about, but uh, you know, let's prioritize it that way. Um, so please, the floor is yours. Start with me. Um, yes, okay. please go ahead. Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, well, well, key challenges. Um, to keep it brief, um, research and development, investments in, in research and development because we need to increase efficiency uh, in the whole supply chain, 
So, and, um, and policy. We need to implement policy to support biofuels and investment in research and development. Basically, this is, I think these are the main key aspects for the development of biofuels. And we need somehow to uh, recognize um, the positive externalities of biofuels. So the environmental uh, product that we have associated with biofuels, for example, decarbonization. Uh, okay, I, I uh, Platy can make a, 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 another remark on what Jack can say, because uh, to really have the price of the fuels related to their impact, so not only on the production price. So uh, what is, uh, you say in some way, the carbon tax. The carbon tax for biofuel cannot be the same for fossil fuel. And that is something that we must address because that is going to shift the investment. Because now, if you start to add a cost to uh, fossil fuels, all the other alternatives be become competitive. We don't want probably to have incentive in the production of biofuel, but simply to have some disincentive in the production of the very impacting uh, uh, energy media. And that is really, uh, I think, uh, what is really impossible. And also the regulation, because uh, uh, to change, uh, to do a new investment, especially in a country like Italy, is very difficult. And uh, for example, we have uh, all the refinery plant that can be converted in bio refinery. So they are already, uh, for them is already possible to accept as uh, the new raw material, uh, biomasses or waste uh, instead of oil or natural gas. But uh, the regulation now is making that very difficult. So in many cases, it, uh, it are the rules that are not following the progress of science. And Dr. De Oder, we go. Yeah, I would add that uh, the, the big problem for scaling is uh, are the environmental constraints. So if uh, uh, we want to, to scale it up and uh, meet the current uh, uh, demand for fossil fuels with biofuels, we don't have enough resources for that. We did some back of the envelope calculations years ago. It will take uh, all the water, all the evapotranspiration from all terrestrial ecosystems to sustain, to replace the fossil fuels with the biofuels. Because uh, with the fossil fuels, basically, we are using water resources from the past that have been stored below ground virtually. And so we don't have the resources. We can do the same calculations with land. We have done that. Um, we would need to replace all agricultural land. So it's a very short blanket. Uh, so if you want really to scale it up, uh, we cannot do that. So overall, biofuels can be just a, a little bit more than a drop in the bucket before they start really encroaching food systems. And we saw that we had in recent decades some problems of food availability, global food crisis, escalation of food prices. And clearly there is a, a, the competition with biofuels is strong. So one thing that emerges from this report that I think is of great value is to see that uh, the, uh, either the use of uh, waste of non-food, uh, uh, um, non-first generation biofuels could be very interesting. And also the combination of biofuels with the BEX systems to do the carbon capture and storage. And so use photosynthesis not to replace fossil fuels, but to do something better than that. So these are very interesting avenues that can really lead to more than a drop in the bucket in the system. Uh, otherwise, all the other things that we have seen uh, tend to be a little bit uh, uh, limiting. The, also, the whole discussion about marginal lands uh, is always very controversial because someone is using those lands. And uh, also the idea of having some sacrifice zones to, uh, at the disposal of the energy system is not necessarily a, a good one. But uh, again, to scale up, I think they, they, um, these new technologies coupled with the biofuels would be very interesting. I, I, if I can add something to uh, Paolo, is that uh, if you consider that in Europe uh, now every citizen 
is producing almost a ton of waste, so organic waste, eh? and we are consuming almost a ton of fossil fuels. So if you consider waste to fossil fuel is almost a, an equivalence. So from that, we are not using land, and uh, that is the real new prospective. That's a great segue to what was going to be my next question, which is which technologies and feedstocks do you think are most likely to play a role as we move to a 2050 net zero world? Um, food waste being an excellent example of a feedstock that uh, could play a big role. Um, well, I'll give each of you a chance to answer this as well, but maybe we'll change the order. We'll start with Dr. Masi, then Dr. De Odorico, and then Dr. Sabra. No, what I think uh, really for me is uh, 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 the waste is the new raw material for the next uh, century because we have uh, a huge mining that is there because we accumulate a huge amount of waste if you think to plastics, for example. Because from my point of view, plastics, wood are practically the same things. When I'm going to gasification, when I'm going to pyrolysis, there is almost no difference. And that are perfect material for the biorefining. But uh, still, I cannot say no to the use uh, of uh, vegetable uh, biomass because it's local. Uh, in Europe, uh, probably in US, we have a huge amount of waste. But there are community, especially rural community, where the waste are really limited. And so if they have, uh, uh, wastes that are coming from the agriculture after we extract what we had to eat, that is nice. Yeah, I don't have much more to add. I think uh, the food waste is a big one. It's uh, one third of the food production has been estimated to be wasted. There is a lot of agricultural waste. So these are great, really great uh, uh, options. And this whole idea of circular economies to reuse things before we, which anyway, the, uh, this organic material would be sooner or later be respired and emit CO2 into the atmosphere. So we better get energy out of it. Then uh, there is uh, um, also non food related biofuels. Here in California, there is a lot of problem, as you know, from uh, uh, fires, and this is due to the ba bad forest practices of forest suppression. There is a lot of biomass that can be done through forest thinning, can, can be removed and can be used for uh, uh, biofuels. I'm sure that in other places around the world, there are other opportunities that are, uh, again, not crop, but uh, other forms of biomass that could be interesting to to use instead of uh, uh, putting it a more useful uh, use from the point of view of the energy. I think this is my turn. Um, well, uh, I have a different perspective from what has been said. I, of course, I totally agree that wastes are um, one of the main options that we have for bioenergy. But uh, from the perspective of a developing country with a large availability of areas, we do have a huge potential to grow crops for energy without compromising other uses because we do have land. So high efficiency crops, for example, sugarcane, this is one example, um, we can produce first and second generation biofuels in the future. So I do believe that we still have lots of room to expand biofuels uh, using first generation technologies combined with second generation technologies using high efficiency crops and biomasses. In addition to waste, of course, and I'm not uh, denying this fact. And uh, also because of the rural development, we have several uh, potential implications positive potential implications for local economies associated with bioenergy and biofuels. So this is one aspect that I have to bring here. But uh, uh, just to be clear, we even here in Brazil and other developing countries, we do not expect to replace 100% of the fossil fuels with biofuels. No, the potential is not quite there, but I think the contribution can be huge, can be very important, not 
Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions that have come in to the floor about different feedstocks, and I will throw them out there and I'll leave it up to you uh, to decide who would like to answer. Um, so uh, we have George who's asking about um, the use of cow dung, or I'm going to include, you know, manure from other sort of uh, industrial livestock scale operations. Um, what are the possibilities for that as a feedstock? And then Christina Tonito is asking uh, very similar about uh, if we can turn wastewater um, and other sort of wastewater sewage uh, waste streams into biofuels. I don't know who would like to take that. If you wave, I can call on you or you could just jump in. Perhaps Mauricio could start. Uh, okay, but I don't get very well the, 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 the answer. It's because I was looking to read in the... Uh, uh, the use of cow dug to be promoted, yes, because uh, it, it's already in process. So we are using... Uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, wastes, uh, for example, in Italy for the production of biogas. So, so biogas uh, is naturally produced by uh, the waste of the animals. So it's uh, it's a process already in uh, in line. And anyone want to take the sort of follow up on human sewage or wastewater uh, as well? I don't know if there are operations to do the same with that for biogas or other ways. No, no, no. Used. Yes, yes. Because uh, in the production of waste, in, in the wastewater treatment, uh, you use a lot of uh, biological treatment. So you are uh, adding the microorganisms that they are grown. They are uh, practically capturing the eating uh, the, the waste. Uh, the organic content, and they end their, their life cycle, so they die. Then when you obtain a mud that is mostly uh, not uh, made by uh, the mud of the wastewater, it's made by the microorganism that we have inside. And those microorganisms now we enter in a fermentation. We are feeding them to other microorganisms to be transformed in biogas. Biogas, the problem is that 50% is methane and 50% is carbon dioxide. So you need to purify, and then you can have a catalytic process that is called methanation to transform the CO2 in uh, all in methane. But there are many examples. Even uh, the wastewater treatment plant uh, of Milano has this uh, kind of plant. I don't have much more to add there yeah, because uh, but the, the thing is that the, uh, there is production of gas, but the, one of the other uh, uh, product by products of this process is uh, some uh, uh, fertilizers or materials can yes, be so. used for fertilizer. So they also the city of DC has a huge uh, um, uh, uh, water treatment, uh, wastewater treatment plant that uh, produces with this digest uh, uh, gas and also uh, fertilizers. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't have much to add, uh, except that, yeah, again, um, we need policy support to uh, give the right direction and the message that investors can engage in this type of investment and other stakeholders can look at this and invest in this type of process. So, again, I think policy support is essential. Great, and I'll add for my two cents as well, uh, one of the people who asked one of the questions about that as well sort of raised the issue around infrastructure. So in addition to your comment on investment, I think making sure that you have the, the infrastructure as well to do some of these things on older yes. wastewater treatment plants or um, you know farms and manure ponds, et cetera, is important. Um, this is a really exciting conversation, and I also want to remind everyone uh, that this is just one session of part of the Zero Emission Solution Conference, and the one that is following this immediately after us um, is also about food and waste and anaerobic digestion. Uh, that'll start about 30 minutes after we close here, so um, about 50 minutes from now. Um, and we'll be able to get into all of this uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, but kind of keeping with this vein as well, we have a couple questions that I think are related um, around some of the challenges with this. Um, so we have one 
question about um, issues with biofuel production, possibly having some negative effects for biodiversity loss um, and nitrogen runoff into waterways. Um, they want to know if that's true. I'm going to expand that to say, are there solutions that can kind of prevent some of those negative effects from happening? And I'm also going to link that to um, another comment we got um, from Edward asking if um, you know more small scale production might be a solution as well versus some of these more large scale um, industrial production uh, production scale and addressing some of these concerns. Again, I'm not sure who wants to start first, but feel free to jump in. I, I can say just a few words about the biodiversity. I think the main concern here is when uh, the production of biofuel happens in conjunction with land use change, habitat destruction, which is the big driver for loss of biodiversity. Uh, so we know that uh, uh, there have been concerns, for example, they, I don't want to pick uh, particular cases, but some areas have been affected by deforestation induced by, uh, directed by the uh, production of um, uh, oil palm. And so those are problems that uh, now the commu international communities are sensitive to, and there is uh, 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 some attention to uh, production of biofuels that don't induce this land use change or directly. But we have seen that there are also indirect land use changes with the uh, biofuel crops displacing food production systems, uh, range production, et cetera, that then encroaches into natural habitats. So this indirect land use change is much harder to, to uh, track and to document. And so that uh, can be one of the undesired effects. Of course, when we switch, uh, uh, and again, uh, this was part of this question, uh, uh, the, the production of biofuels from uh, um, um, the production, uh, the, the switch from uh, uh, traditional farming systems to industrialized uh, production of uh, biofuel crops. Uh, often there is a use of fertilizers that uh, has uh, uh, detrimental environmental impacts, if it's, uh, particularly if it's overused. Um, so they, one of the questions was suggesting whether it was possible to use a more traditional or small scale farming systems without, I, I assume we can use that, put that under the umbrella of sustainable farming, agroecology, et cetera, to produce biofuels. Of course, that, that, is, uh, um, that is always an option. I don't know how the economics would play out because overall the production of biofuels needs to be done in conjunction also with the presence of uh, refineries and uh, other industrial systems. So I'm not an economist, I cannot comment on that. If I can add a comment, uh, not on the biodiversity, uh, which I uh, am not so an expert to discuss about that, but uh, there is a, a sector uh, uh, where we can use biofuels. Uh, in decarbonizing uh, very heavy industrial sectors, like, uh, for example, the cement industry. In the cement industry, you have uh, some part of the CO2 that is unbeatable because uh, uh, it's given by the reaction from the carbonate to the calcium oxide that you are releasing CO2. If you want to produce the cement, uh, you are emitting the CO2. But uh, all the CO2 that is coming to the eating up your, uh, your, your kiln, your raw material, is really in, important that there be a, a, a biofuel, because in that case, you, you are not adding other CO2 to the process. Uh, you are producing uh, in molar base two molecules of CO2. Now, your cement process that is fed with biofuel is going to emit only one mole of CO2. So it's a 50% it's a advantage. Okay, uh, just quick comments here about the biodiversity. Of course, we are, we are all very concerned about deforestation and uh, this is a primary aspect. So we need to avoid deforestation period. Uh, and uh, we don't need to cause any deforestation to expand um, biofuels production. And this is an important brand message and should be uh, respected. And once again, we need policy support to avoid deforestation and uh, proper track of the uh, land use change in countries and regions. 
but I think the message is um, there is plenty of room to expand biofuels in several parts of the globe without the need uh, for deforestation. The potential is there. We have lands that are suitable for bioenergy production. And uh, when I say suitable, it means that we can uh, have access to the sweet amount of water without causing any major damage to the ecosystems. And so we can provide food, feed, uh, energy, and other products from this piece of land without causing major damages to the nature. So uh, uh, to keep it brief, that's the idea. And we have several references in the report that explore all these aspects in detail. So again, I encourage people to take a look at the report. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sayabra. I think I'll follow up with another question that's uh, targeted directly to you as it concerns uh, sort of the on the ground experience in Brazil. Andrea is asking how the Brazilian energy transition um, will happen. So she's saying with deforestation and the current increase of fossil fuel prices, could this scenario cause a momentary economic crisis, inflation with reduced industrial production, and how could this affect the transition process in Brazil? Um, I hope I caught it all. I hope it's clear. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, indeed, we have a, a very difficult situation here in Brazil, not only in Brazil, but we do have inflation. We have some constraints in terms of the supply. Um, deforestation has increased, not because of bioenergy and biofuels. We have several other problems uh, happening at the same time. So I think it's important to deattach one process to the other. So deforestation is a separate problem in the country. And we do have this problem to face. But again, uh, policies are already in place in the country for the expansion of biofuels in a sustainable way. So avoiding deforestation. So it's, it's already there uh, to expand the biofuels in other renewable sources, not only for the transport sector, uh, but we, need, we do need these policies to be there, but the good news, they are working. Uh, one example that I can give for the Brazilian case specifically is the new biofuels policy, Renova Bio or Renova Bio. Uh, so the idea is to expand the use of biofuels, not actually to expand the biofuel, the use of biofuels, but to expand the decarbonization process of the transport sector using biofuels, more and more efficient biofuels, avoiding deforestation. So that's the main idea. Uh, but again, it all comes to the policy support, giving the right direction for investors. I hope I have answered the question, but in case there are more doubts that we can discuss. Great. And I'll also just flag that one of the outcomes of COP26 already has been this big commitment by, um, I believe it's about 100 countries, including Brazil, to achieve net zero deforestation by 2030. So, um, you know, hopefully we can achieve all these ambitious goals to both expand biofuel use, but also halt deforestation. Um, I think we only have time for one more question. I regret to all of the participants that we couldn't get to every single question that was sent. They've all been very good. Um, but I'm going to close with a bigger picture question that comes to us from Connie. Um, she's asking about the regulations that frequently limit new feedstocks and or new biofuels from entering the market. It seems that most biofuels are first generation, perhaps because new technologies have regulatory challenges in getting approved and entering the market. Um, so I think that's a good uh, question to close on about this issues around uh, regulation and governance and how we can support this transition. Again, you know, whoever wants to jump in. Okay, Connie, you are right. Uh, we are facing now more legislation barrier than technological barrier, especially in Italy and the rest of Europe. I don't know exactly in the other countries, probably US, you are more free, but uh, uh, regulation uh, in Italy are crazy. They are not in favor of the transition up to now. I just wanted to comment um, for a moment to, to the implications of that, because this means that the most of the day production remains the first generation biofuels with all the problems we have highlighted. Mm. And uh, also we shouldn't, uh, of course, uh, they, um, 
the concerns about uh, conflicting with production of food and other systems, particularly if when uh, in periods of uh, global shortage uh, can be real. And I agree with Joaquin that they, uh, there is the option of using marginal lands, but uh, we shouldn't uh, think that there is a, a unlimited potential there. The, the, we, the uh, land of the planet is finite. Uh, many, uh, a lot of land is already used by uh, local communities, indigenous groups around the world. We shouldn't uh, uh, push to, for additional land grabs around the world. Uh, also marginal lands, sometimes uh, uh, some of these analyses don't, don't account for the fact that uh, they are not suitable for cultivation. We have a long history of uh, uh, putting under the plow land that was not meant to be. The American with Midwest with the uh, North Plains with the Dust Bowl is the typical example and many other examples around the world. So not all land is uh, suitable for uh, uh, being cultivated and can be rather used for uh, as a pasture or for other uses. So when we account for these different factors, in addition to the fact that uh, there is uh, uh, the need for water and, uh, and uh, uh, either rainwater or irrigation, then the options uh, remain, of course, are there, but uh, they're not as, as big as we think of. So they, all this uh, uh, plan for renewable energy needs to really to hinge on non-fuel-based uh, non uh, renewable energy. And with the, the fact that the report clearly shows that there is a, a, the uh, advantage of these of biofuels are for uh, uh, integration in systems of for uh, uh, carbon capture and storage to, to have uh, negative emissions. So that would be the real uh, way forward. Okay. Uh, well, um, I'm not sure if I pressed the. the question here uh, because uh, compared to the first generation biofuels I think regulations around the world are more uh, uh, they will I think they are more suitable for the second generation biofuels but the problem for example here in Brazil and other developing countries is the economic uh, problem here uh, the second generation technologies they are not able to compete yet with the first generation biofuels but they are quite there. Uh, here in Brazil, we already have a couple examples of planting uh, of new plants that are starting uh, the production of second generation biofuels. And the policy support is more or less there. Okay. Um, but of course, this, this is a local situation, and local regulations need to address the local problems. So if there is a big constraint for the expansion of bioenergy using uh, first generation crops, of course, regulations must, must take care of this, but in parts of the globe where we do have the potential, we must combine first, second generation advanced technologies to use uh, all the elements that we have, all the tools that we have to decarbonize emissions in the transport. So in this case, I believe new regulations that are out there in place, um, uh, again, I give the example here for the case of Brazil. I think there is uh, very good uh, room for the expansion of advanced second generation technologies, but the problem is the economic performance at this point. Thank you so much. So uh, regretfully, we're running short on time. This has been a very rich discussion that, you know, I'm sure we could continue for hours on such a large uh, and complex and important topic. Um, thank you so much. Unfortunately, I think we're going to have to leave it here for now. I'd like to introduce Filippo Tassari, head of the office of the executive director of FEM, who has worked with SDSN on both the roadmap reports, uh, the, the first one and this new one on biofuels. And he's going to share a little bit about the vision forward uh, and our next steps on this partnership and this project and what you can expect to see from us in the future. Yeah, thank you very much, Lorraine. Uh, also, I want to thank so, to all the attendees and the coaches for the fantastic effort that allowed us to be here today despite uh, all the obstacles we had to go through in the last year and a half. This is a, a global issue. Um, let me also mention the solid and critical contribution received by more or less 100 experts from key public and private institutions who attended the 2020 workshop and give uh, additional consultation process, giving feedback, comments, and hence uh, providing an holistic perspective to our work. 
I, I just would echo the comments made by Professor Galeotti in his uh, opening. Uh, uh, it is a great pleasure to follow on uh, the Path of Roadmap uh, project along with SDSN. We consider it's a valuable partnership uh, with great results in terms of outcomes. The motivation is still the same since the first report released in 2019, that is to provide a technical guide to be intended as a compass for policymakers to design and foster the implementation of the carbonization pathways relying on available techno technologies. Uh, taking into consideration their applicability, uh, socioeconomic impacts on different contexts, and cost effectiveness of their de deployment at a large scale. Uh, now we are entering a, a crucial phase where every decision needs to be made extremely urgently, but at the same time very carefully. Uh, the post-pandemic recovery plans are offering huge opportunity of unprecedented investments aimed to reach the net zero emission by 2050. Uh, just to mention a European Green Deal is one uh, uh, in the European framework. And for this reason, it's important to have a clear vision of the wide range of effective action that can potentially be implemented. And this framework works dealing with mitigation technologies as the first two chapters of the roadmap uh, surely are crucial. But on the other hand, uh, it might be also important not to underestimate the value of identifying adaptation solutions in order to effectively fight climate change as of today and simultaneously plan and design solution for decarbonization in the medium and long term. So there are many think, key topics on the table. There are several, and we are, uh, as Fondazione Enrico Mattei, determined to continue fostering the global dialogue on such teams through our collaboration with the SDSN. Uh, for now and also in the future. So uh, for this reason, just a little spoiler, but we, we are already brainstorming on the direction of the next uh, year's effort. Uh, we will uh, uh, look forward to see you again, uh, hopefully in person in uh, 2022. And uh, please stay updated with the work of this uh, very fruitful partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, we are so grateful to all the participants who joined us today. Uh, it's been my honor to be your moderator, and it's uh, been a real pleasure to listen to such wonderful presentations from our panel of expert authors. I hope you'll engage, continue, excuse me, I hope you'll continue to engage with us online, download the report, enjoy it, uh, and I hope to see many of you online as well for the next session of our uh, Zero Emission Solutions Conference starting in just about 30 minutes. Thank you so much, everyone. I wish everyone a wonderful rest of your day and stay safe and, uh, you know, decarbonize. We're, we're gonna get there. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.